Today I'm going to make a beautiful fluorescent compound from some scrap copper that I had intended to throw away. This particular compound glows very brightly under UV light, and comes in two distinct colors depending on how you make it. Now, making this chemical requires the fairly uncommon copper iodide along with pyridine, which I made in last week's video if you'd like to give that a look first. Considering that copper iodide is something of a specialty reagent that most people don't have lying around, I'll be making that first. But if you do happen to already have some, feel free to skip to the time shown on screen. Now to go ahead and get started, I've got some scrap pieces of copper which I added to a beaker along with some concentrated hydrochloric acid. Copper is a noble metal and not readily attacked by hydrochloric acid alone, and so to get it to dissolve to copper chloride, it needs oxygen. If you aren't really pressed for time, the oxygen can be provided by simply bubbling air through the solution using an aquarium bubbler or something like that. Alternatively, you can also add some hydrogen peroxide to the mix, which is what I decided to do. You can see when the peroxide is added that the surface of the copper is quickly oxidized to black copper oxide. This copper oxide immediately dissolves in the hydrochloric acid, forming copper 2 chloride. However, the large amount of excess copper present will eventually react with the green copper 2 chloride, forming two molecules of copper 1 chloride, which appears a very dark brown in concentrated acid. As a result, the solution will quickly darken to the point of being nearly completely opaque. Now while it's certainly easier to make a soluble copper salt by electrolysis in sulfuric acid or dissolution in nitric acid, this method produces a lot of monovalent copper which is somewhat easier to convert to copper iodide than divalent copper. Anyway, once all the peroxide had been used up and the reaction was stopped, I went ahead and dumped my brown copper 1 chloride solution into some distilled water. This immediately began to precipitate tiny white crystals of the barely soluble copper 1 chloride, which I collected by vacuum filtration and set aside for another project I'm working on. The filtrate still contains a lot of dissolved monovalent copper and was transferred to a new beaker, and to this I slowly began to add a saturated solution of potassium iodide. As soon as the potassium iodide was added, a dense white precipitate of copper iodide began to crash out. This was continued until the white precipitate had begun to slightly darken indicating that all the monovalent copper ions had been used up and iodine had begun to form. The iodine was removed by adding a bit more copper 1 chloride back to the mix, and once the precipitate had completely whitened, I collected it all by passing the mixture through vacuum filtration. This left me with a small puck of pure copper 1 iodide, which I scraped into a watch glass and set overnight to dry. As a quick note, I only made copper iodide this way because I thought it would be fun to start from elemental copper for this video, and I had some scrap I wanted to get rid of. If you would prefer a more straightforward way to make copper iodide, begin by dissolving 4 grams of anhydrous sodium sulfite in around 50 milliliters of water. Next you want to dissolve 10 grams of copper sulfate pentahydrate in a minimal volume of water and combine it with the sulfite mixture. Add a few drops of sulfuric acid, set this aside, and dissolve 7 grams of potassium iodide in around 20 milliliters of water. For the final step, add this to the acidic copper sulfate and sodium sulfite solution to precipitate pure copper iodide. Direct combination of copper sulfate and potassium iodide will also form copper iodide, but will also co-precipitate elemental iodine if sulfite or metabasulfite isn't used. Anyway, after letting the copper iodide sit overnight, it had dried completely and now it was time to start making my glowing copper compound. To do this, I first transferred 5 grams of copper iodide to a beaker along with 7.5 grams of potassium iodide and around 25 milliliters of water. While copper iodide is nearly completely insoluble in water, it can form a soluble complex with excess iodide. This results in a mixture containing both solid copper iodide and the soluble complex which discolors it a light yellow. In a separate beaker, I then combined 20 milliliters of acetone along with 5 milliliters of pyridine, which represents a significant excess. Keep in mind that pyridine is quite toxic, and so take care when handling it. Once the two are thoroughly incorporated, the mixture is poured into the beaker containing the copper iodide mixture under constant stirring. As soon as the chemicals combine, there's a strongly exothermic reaction accompanied by some intermittent color changes. Eventually, a dense, nearly white precipitate forms, and this is the insoluble complex formed by the reaction shown here. As you can see, four molecules of the soluble copper iodide complex react with four molecules of pyridine forming one molecule of the target complex along with four molecules of iodide. 
This iodide then immediately reacts with the still undissolved copper iodide, which is why you might have noticed it begin to dissolve the moment the reaction began. As far as the product molecule goes, it has a rather complex structure with a copper iodine tetrahedron at its core. Each copper is coordinated to three other coppers, three iodines, and one pyridine which point outward. As a result, this complex is incredibly insoluble in water as all the copper ions are trapped behind highly insoluble pyridines. Anyway, I went ahead and allowed the mixture to continue reacting for a couple minutes and then turned off my stir plate. As soon as the stirring was gone, the dense complex quickly settled to the bottom which is really convenient for decanting off the wastewater. On that note, to clean my final product of excess pyridine, I basically just decanted the clear liquid off the top added more distilled water, waited for the complex to settle, and then repeated the process two more times. The resulting mixture was passed through vacuum filtration to collect the solid product and dried in open air overnight. My final mass was 6.5 grams, representing a 92.8% yield. Now, looking at the dry product, it is a very slightly off-white powder in normal lighting. However, under UV light, the compound exhibits extremely strong bright yellow fluorescence. This yellow is so intense that it's still highly visible when the main lights are turned back on, which is pretty unique for fluorescent compounds. The chemical is also fairly stable as far as I can tell, but it is destroyed by concentrated acids or bases, as well as high heat. Now, moving on to the green fluorescent version of this compound, I began by adding a half gram of the copper iodide and 0.6 grams of potassium iodide to a test tube along with a few milliliters of water. This represents a tenth scale of my first batch, and I'll explain why I scaled this one down so much in a second. In a separate test tube, I then combined one milliliter of pyridine with a few milliliters of water and swirled the test tube thoroughly to combine the two. You'll notice here that this time I used water instead of acetone and twice the amount of pyridine relative to the copper iodide. At this point, the two mixtures were combined just like before, but this time the resulting precipitate is distinctly yellow. When exposed to the same UV light as before, the complex made this way is a distinct and beautiful cyan green. The color difference here is particularly obvious when placed right next to the yellow fluorescent version, and I'm honestly not sure which one I like more. As for why I made so little of the green version, the main reason is that it's highly unstable and unfortunately not something I can really collect and store. This instability is due to a breakdown of the complex caused by a loss of pyridine, which can actually be prevented if the compound is stored in an ampule along with an excess of aqueous pyridine. Otherwise, the compound will slowly lose pyridine and break down into the yellow fluorescent version over time. As for the structure of this second complex, I wasn't able to find any diagrams in any literature, but the empirical formula is shown here and represents a molar ratio of one part copper to two parts pyridine and two parts iodine. Contrast this with the empirical formula of the initial complex shown here, representing equal parts copper, pyridine, and iodine. I'm not really positive what the complex would actually look like, but that never was my strongest skill in chemistry. If you've got any ideas on this, I would love to hear them in the comments. One more quick note I figured I'd mention is that although I referred to this project in the past as making an organometallic complex, this compound is different from what some would consider organometallic. I learned and have always considered any compound that contains an organic group bound to a metal to be organometallic. However, some chemists only narrowly define organometallics as compounds that contain a direct bond between a metal and carbon. Seeing as how the compound I made in this video is bound to carbon through a nitrogen atom, it would be more precisely called a metal organic complex, although the IUPAC has not formally defined this distinction. Now, on its surface, this might all seem nitpicky, but there is a significant difference between true organometallics and organometallic complexes like this one. This difference lies in how the actual bond forms and this gives me a chance to quickly talk about coordination bonds. Now, a true organometallic bond is highly covalent, and typically speaking, covalent bonds are strongest between elements with similar electronegativities, which is why they often form between nonmetals and other nonmetals. As many metals are strongly electropositive, the covalent organometallic bond is often very weak. 
Of the group 1 elements, lithium organometallics are the most stable with the stability decreasing as you move down. Transition metal organometallics are broadly much more stable, particularly the minimally reactive and fairly electronegative noble metals. Organometallic coordination complexes, on the other hand, form an entirely different type of bond, called a dipolar bond. This bond is similar to a covalent bond, except that both electrons involved come from the same atom. Dipolar bonds are pervasive in chemistry. They're the bonds that hold water to a metal center in every hydrated salt and often exist in solution. Nitrogen is especially prone to complexing with a metal as it tends to have some extra electrons to give away. This is why compounds like ammonia, cyanide, ethylene diamine, and EDTA so readily form complexes. And it's also why pyridine was able to bond to copper in the reaction I did today. There really is far too much to talk about with this topic to cover right now, but if you'd like to learn more about metal complexes and dipolar bonds, I'd love you to let me know down below. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. I plan to make another pyridine complex next week using cobalt, so feel free to subscribe and check back next week if that's something you'd like to see. With that, I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my wonderful patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very, very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Feel free to keep watching this footage I got of the beautiful copper complexes, and I'll see you all next time.